everyone. Our scripture this morning is found in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 45, verses 4 and 5. And it reads, And Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, I pray you. And they did so. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But do not be distressed and disheartened with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Shirley. Our speaker today is Carl Thomas, and I understand that he's not the only one who's speaking, that a bunch of you are involved. So Carl, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I think this is on. I don't know about you, this is a scary position to be in. I can stand down there and teach a Sabbath school lesson without a problem. To stand in this pulpit, something else. Today's sermon is titled Joseph and the Remnant. And it's going to be different in that we're going to read scripture. And people throughout the audience are going to help me read that scripture from that perspective. So we will know exactly where it is. And I'll call your name when, you, when I want you to read. I want to talk about the Trump rally last Sabbath. As I said earlier, there were 5,618 great controversies that were passed out. There were 14 of us to do it. And that was not enough, and we actually ran out of books. But I want you to understand, you do not go into the actual secure area. The only way I seen any part of Trump was on a, a jumbotron from here to Main Street, I think it was. It seemed like forever away. In fact, you couldn't tell really who was speaking. Um, we did get to see his plane fly over, and they circled over the thing, and then came around, and how he got there this time, I have no idea. But on Wednesday of this week in Reading, Pennsylvania, there was three people to hand out books, and they handed out 3,000 books. God is here, and God is with us. If you get the chance, go. Because it's amazing, people there as we were handing books out every once in a while if it's the first time we've heard that but a couple people said that is a fantastic book i have read that book you take it and read it it will change your life and so when you hear that two or three times and especially this person that standing here in front which says um doubting and i'm not sure i want to do that on sabbath and miss the sabbath school and all that stuff we actually were able to go to church this last week and, and met in a little church that's smaller than this church, which was really interesting. Um, they were very um, reluctant at first, but as we talked about what it was, we had several of them come and join us, which helped make the 14, so it was really neat. All right, we're going to start the sermon. Deb? And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilpah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. One of the great things about the Bible is its ability to bring meaning and, meanings and significance to the seemingly common events of everyday life. Here in the verses we just read, we get an insight into the domestic climate that existed within Jacob's home as one fraction of a family would attempt to undermine the other and attempt to gain its favor, bringing an atmosphere of strife and contention into their home. And yet, even in this less than ideal situation, we see God at work 
to bring about his own divine plan and purpose for each individual involved in this story to enable them to have a part in his great plan of redemption. Annette? This is jo um, Genesis 37, 5 through 11. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Here in these two dreams gives Joseph, given to Joseph, to see God not only calling him into his service, but also initiating a chain of events in his life that will ultimately lead to the fulfillment of his dreams. And in order to impress upon Joseph's mind, we see God doubling it, giving him two dreams back to back that convey the same message in order to give him the conviction that he's going to need to carry him through the, his wilderness experience. Shall I and thy, and thy mother and thy brother indeed bow down ourselves to the, to the earth? Notwithstanding the apparent severity of his, wor of his words, Jacob believes that the Lord is revealing the future to Joseph. And as the lad stood before his brothers, his beautiful countenance light, lighted up with a spirit of inspiration. They could not withhold their admiration, but they did not choose to renounce their evil ways. And they hated the, the purity that, that reproved their sin. And the same spirit that attain, actuated Cain was kindled in their heart. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 210. We pick up the story in verse 18 with Jacob sending Joseph to check on his brothers who was, who was tending the family flocks. David? Got it. When they saw him from a distance and before they came close to him, uh, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. With a joyful heart, Joseph parted from his father. Need, from his father, neither the aged man nor the youth dreamed of what would happen before they should meet again. When, after his long and so solitary journey, Joseph arrived in Shechem, his brothers, his brothers and their flocks were not to be found. Upon inquiring from them, he was directed to Dothan. He had already traveled more than 50 miles, and now an, ex, an, an additional distance of 15 miles lay before him. But he hastened on, forgetting his weariness in the thought of, re, of relieving the anxiety of his father and meeting the brothers whom, despite their unkindliness, he still loved. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 210. One of the problems we face in studying the life of Joseph is the fact 
that we know how the story ends. So it became easy to read right through some of those events like it is no big deal. But when you're 17 year old and your brother, 10 brothers are ganged up on you, beat you up, throw you in a pit, sold you into slavery and slipped you off, shipped you off to a foreign country where you're put in the hands of a stranger whose only concern is that he, can't, he could get out of you and could care less about our future. It's kind of a big deal. This universe, pref this unwise preference, bowing down to him, had aggravated his brothers and provoked them to the cruel deeds that had separated him from his home. It, its efforts were manifested also in his own character. Faults had, been faults had been encouraged that were now to be corrected. He was becoming self-sufficient and exacting. Accustomed to the tenderness of his father's care, he, he felt that he was unprepared to cope with the difficulties before him in the bitter, uncaring for life of a stranger and a slave. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 113. At this point in time, Joseph had two things going for him. One, the promise of God through his dreams to exalt him. Two, the testimony of his father and his grandfather of God's faithfulness despite difficulties to fulfill his promises. David. Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Israel, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he, all that he had, he put in his hand. Here, you're next. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The temptations he has is actually twofold. First of all, there's a physical uh, temptation. What she is asking him to do wasn't exactly unpleasant or unappealing. Two, there's also the temptation to hope that by going along with what she is suggesting that he might somehow gain his freedom through her influence with Potiphar. Now Joseph had learned from his experience of his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather that sin never really pays, and it often has very nasty long-term consequences that are devour, that are detour God's, that can detour God's plan for our lives. If we were to cherish the habitual impression that God sees and hears all that we do and say, and keeps a faithful record of our words and actions, and that we must meet it all. We would, never fear, we would never fear to sin. Let, your, let the youth ever remember that wherever they are and whatever they do, they are in the presence of God. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 217. Now apparently, Potiphar's wife wasn't in the habit of, being, of taking no for an answer. But the Bible tells us that one day when Joseph was working in the house, she grabbed a hold of him and he had to take off running so fast that he left his coat behind. Maggie? So she kept his garment with her until his, his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant who you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened, as I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled outside. 
So it was, when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Did you ever have a day where things seemed to go so bad you didn't think they could even get any worse? And they did. That's what happened to Joseph in the morning, that he was the slave in charge of his master's household, whole house, and by evening he was a convicted criminal in prison, in chains, as things seemed to go from bad to worse. Hugh? But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who, who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The Bible tells us that one day they got two new prisoners into the prison, Pharaoh's butler and his baker, Shirley. And they said to him, we have dreamed dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream I saw a vine before me, and on the vine were three branches. And it was as though it budded, its blossoms burst forth, and the clusters of them brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. Then I gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will again put Pharaoh's cup into his hand, as when you were his butler." But think of me when it shall be well with you, and show kindness, I beg of you, and mention me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this house. For truly I was carried away from the land of the Hebrews by unlawful force, and here too I have done nothing for which they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also dreamed, and behold, I had three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket were some of all kinds of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds of prey were eating out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered, This is the interpretation of that. The three baskets are three days. Within three days Pharaoh will lift up your head, but will have you beheaded and hung on a tree. And you will not so much as be given a burial, but the birds will eat your flesh. And on the third day, Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the heads of the chief butler and the chief baker by inviting them also among his servants. And he restored the chief butler to his butlership, and the butler gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. But even after all that, the chief butler gave no thought to Joseph, but forgot all about him. Now at this point, if you had gotten, had gotten Joseph out of the prison for one day to go to church with you for a testimony service, do you know what his testimony would have been after 12 years of trusting God? Poverty, imprisonment, justice, hatred, abandonment, loneliness, uncertainty, temptation, ingratitude, and bondage. What a testimony. Pretty hard to say praise the Lord for all that. But, but the Bible tells us that outside of the prison, things were happening that were about to change. Joseph's testimony. One night God gave Pharaoh a dream and then another, and when no one was able to interpret it, the butler suddenly remembered Joseph. And in one moment, Joseph rose from the, dragon, or from the dungeon 
to the palace of the prime minister over the entire land of Egypt. As we look back over the life of Joseph, it all begins to make sense how God was guiding and directing the events of his life to prepare Joseph and to put him in the right place at the right time to accomplish his purposes and to fulfill all his promises to him. Now what does all this mean? What does all this have to do with us today? You, don't, you didn't just stumble into the Adventist church. It's a calling in which you agree to allow God to shape and to mold us in order to fulfill his plan for us. I remember back as a child that my mom and my father stop it. We're always doing things for other people in and outside of the church. Sometimes for pay and a lot of the times just doing it. As kids we had a large garden, at least in my eyes, that we had to hoe and if dad found one weed in it when he got home from work we had to do it all over the next day. We actually got to the point that we actually raked the rows to make sure there was no weeds. That we had to mow the church lawn that took us about two hours to mow with no financial reward other than the physical exercise as my dad said, just do it. It was at the age of 10, I was given a mowing job for $1. My dad had, my dad had me go to work for Mr. Dow and perform me gardening and weeding in his flower beds for eight hours a day at the age of 13. My dad ran a bulldozer all of his life. And a lot of the time on Sunday, he would get us up at 5.30 in the morning and we would go down and pick up the bulldozer and do some job for somebody. I had to help with the shoveling often, something that I hate and still hate today. Uh, in my day, people in my in my day, the people who used to shovel daily called it an idiot stick. It seemed too much. It it didn't take much thought to perform. He made me go to church to church school and to lay, lay bell tile for drainage, which I had never seen or performed before. Just figured out were the words. Then one one home leave from academy. Um, I wanted to go do something with my friends and neighborhood friends and my mom informed me that I had to go to the church school with my dad to work on a buried fuel oil tank that it was leaking water into it. This kind of activity was asked of me frequently. Then Christmas of 1969 and 1970, 1970 and 71 I was able to go to Haiti on a missionary trip. I really saw what, what life was all about and the great privilege it was to help people and have a home. At Andrews University, I had the privilege to go to be on the gymnastic team for two years, again working for Christ and for our fellow man. The, entire, the end results of doing things for others became my life's work. God gave me my profession. As a physical therapist, I didn't earn it grade-wise, but again, it was a gift or a miracle from God and my parents that I was able to get into the Loma Linda Come on. School of Physical Therapy. You need a 4.0 grade point, and mine was nowhere near that high. Ask me, about, ask me something about the miracle later, and I will be, help tell you the story. And I'm going to tell it to you. I was going to make you wait, but I... My mom and dad had a friend in the church, and their son was a friend of ours as well. <laughs> Sorry. And I came home, Jeannie and I came home for a weekend, and I'll back up. I was told, I got a phone call from my dad, which that never, ever happened. But I got it at school, and he said, do you still want to be a physical therapist? And I said, yes. He said, you've got to have your application into, into Loma Linda within the next week and a half. And I went, Dad, I don't even know where the application to get it. He said, I don't know either, but get it done. So I went to my advisor, and they knew enough where to find the application. And somehow, God's will, I got it filled out, and I sent it to school. I came home in February for a weekend with my folks to see my folks. It was 200 miles home. 
And Jeannie was with us, and her folks were 20 miles away. And they came over to pick her up. And when I got home, Mom and Dad were as giddy as two little kids. I, went, I listened to that for a little while, and finally I said, what in the world is going on? Nothing, nothing. I said, no, no, there's something going on. What's going on? Nothing, nothing. Finally, Jeannie and her mom and dad left. And I said, all right, now you're going to tell me. He said, well, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but you're accepted into the School of Physical Therapy. Now, needless to say, the list for who gets in didn't come out till April. We're in the middle of February. And I knew. How I know is because this friend that I talked about, his parents, their daughter ran the dialysis unit for Loma Linda University. Her roommate was one of the teachers that were in the School of Physical Therapy. Somehow God seen. that I was supposed to be a physical therapist. Without God and his miracles, I wouldn't be here today. That is the way it works. Step one prepares you for step two. Step two prepares you for step three, and on it goes. Some of you here today, since joining this church can al almost match Joseph's incidents for incident. You're imprisoned by circumstances that you cannot get yourself out of. Two, you feel like you've, beaten, you've been beaten up by the brethren. Three, if you're enslaved by, bur by burdens and responsibility that seem like they're keeping you in bondage. We're told that the Christian walk is a battle and a march. Do you know what a battle is? That's when you're being attacked from all sides and you're fighting for your life. But a march is different. A march is when you put one foot in front of the other and do it over and over and over again. One monument, mon, 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 I can't say this word, mono, giant step anyway, after another. Mon, there's your word of the word. <laughs> it would not twist and come out. I told you I was scared of you. If you hear something knocking, it's my knees. Uh, step after another. That's the way the Christian walk often goes. A journey from monotony, the same old thing all the time, to conflict, conflict and back again. But we get an idea as to what lies ahead in the books of num Numbers. Deb? Numbers 20, verse 1 and 28. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Verse 28. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there on the top of the mount. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount. In verse 1, Marion dies. In verse 28, Aaron is laid to rest as God raises up a new generation of leaders to begin the final conquest into the promised land of Canaan. At the 11th hour, Lord will call into his service many faithful worshipers or workers. Self-sacrificing men and women will step into the place made vacant by apostasy and death. Two young men and women, as well as those who are old, God will give power from above with convicted minds and convicted, heart, convicted feet and convicted tongues, their lips touched with the coals from off the divine altar, and they go forth into the master's service, moving steadily upward and onward and upward, carrying the work forward up to completion. So the youth instructor, February 13th, 2009. Now we have a lot of old variety of workers and we are a little short of the, of the younger variety. We're missing virtually an entire generation of young people in the 20 to 40 year range who have been in our Sabbath schools, have gone to our church schools, have been through our baptismal classes, and you, you don't see them anymore. Do you know what, where they are at? Outside, taking, advancing their careers, going to football games, and at home watching live streaming or TVs, 
Like Esau, they're selling their birthright for what is sat will satisfy them for today. But the principle cherished by the Pharisees are such as our characteristics of humanity in all ages. The, the spirit of per, per, Phariseeism is the spirit of human nature, legalism. And as the shape, Savior showed the contrast between his own spirit and the method and those of the rabbis, his teaching is equally applicable to the people of all times. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 79. Now, some might say that the problem is that the church is too legalistic and critical and that many or may, many or may not be true, but, but I don't think that is the reason they're not here. Because our evangel evangelical and other Christian friends who let their young people go to the movies on Friday night, ball games on Sabbath, pull pork, pulled pork barbecues on Sunday afternoon are experiencing the same situation in equal and greater numbers. But I believe there is an area where we as a church and individuals have failed our young people and, and each other. Dave. Dave, you're reading. Oh, excuse me. It's, it's James. I'm sorry, I forgot to wrote, wrote the wrong person down. Sorry, thanks James. Okay, Deuteronomy 6, um, verses six and seven. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them. And when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Folks, we need to talk about the blessings of the knowing God and understanding his word. The blessings of honesty and integrity and not having to look back over your shoulder all the time. Blessings of not having to worry about a DUI or parental tests. Blessings of knowing where you, can, where you came from and where you're going. Blessings of knowing that if you make a mistake, and we all do, we have a symp sympathizing God who will roll up his sleeves and help us out and save, us, save your reputation in the, in the process. When we remain silent, we rob, excuse me, when we remain silent, we rob our young people of the bulwark agent testimony, the bulwark's test, agent's testimony, or excuse me, temperation that Joseph had through the testimony of his father and his grandfather. We leave a vacuum that will be filled by their friends, classmates, and coworkers telling them of the blessings of Budweiser, Bacon, Playboy, and parties, as Satan seeks to captivate their mind and ours with earthly pleasures rather than eternal riches. Now the good news is that God is going to call back some of those people who have drifted away. When the storms of persecution really break upon us, the true sleep sheep will hear the, shepherd, the true shepherd's voice. Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost, and many who are strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. The people of God will draw, will draw themselves together and press to, the, press to the enemy a united front. The love of Christ, the love of our brethren, will testify to the world that we have been with Jesus and learned of him. Then will the message of the third angel swell in a loud cry, and the whole earth will be lighted with his glory. Testimonies, volume 6, page 401. We have all known friends that have said that they don't need Christ and the church right now. When they get older, it gets closer to the end of time, they will come back. Jeannie and I have a high school friend and college classmates and members of the church that we spend a lot of time with that have left the church. They wrote us a letter saying that they were going to a Protestant church and that the church is so much better, that the Bible, it was so much more more re meaningful now, that it was so much easier to read and to understand scripture, that they are so much happier. And this is the thing that got me. They wrote, at least God has not struck us dead yet. It brought tears to genies in my eyes. We've been told that when, Mo when Noah was building the ark, he invested everything he had in its construction. He cashed out his 401k. He spent his IRA. 
used the kids', kids college money, money and drained his savings. Everyone around him said, what a shame, how foolish. I feel sorry for this family, but when the first drops of rain hit the ground and the fountains of the deep opened up and the, dark, and the ark lifted off of its foundation, it was shown to be not only a wise investment, but the only investment that was of any value. The Bible says that he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. You can't just flip the switch and start trusting God. When the pressure is on and the outlook is dark, that's why we're given tests and trials now to prepare us for the conflict ahead. We're told in God's word that events are soon to transpire that will impact our world and shake our church to its very foundation. As God brings us to the forefront, those people who he prepared for the greatest moment in our earthly history. In closing, I'm reading a paragraph from the, great, or from the best commentary in the life of Jesus, or Joseph. There is a light shining from the moving tales in the long ago that, shine, that should shine in many a life today, bringing with it rays of cheer and hope for those who may be waiting for, on God in the midst of the disheartening circumstances. The dear heart of the Heavenly Father is beating in the life experiences of each of his disciples. The hand of an all-wise God is working out for each one of his children the predestinated outcome of a divine plan. The hour has, full, the hour has full re, fully revealed, revealed may not strike on the great clock of God, but it will strike never the doubt. Your, time are, your times are in his benevolent hand. Just, lean, just lean, learn this, friend of God, for the glory of God and for your own good, your Father in heaven bids you lay down your burdens of anxiety. Trust all to him. He has guided you on numbered, numbered millions already through life. He can, he will lead you. All things even now are working together for your good. Turn the helm of your life over to the hand, the hands of the captive of our salvation. Our closing song is, I don't know, 331. Oh, Jesus, I have promised.